Good. No problem. We'll just call it out. I'm not going to call him out. I'm just going to ask if anybody's here to speak. All right, we're ready. I'd like to call our meeting to order this January 27th, 2020. I'm going to call on Mayor Pro Tem David Moore to have our invocation. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, Lord, and for your many blessings. We thank you for this group of people here tonight. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. As we make decisions for our city tonight, guide us, direct us, and lead us in the direction you would have us to go in. All we want to do, Lord, in the end is please you and all that we do. Lord, again, thank you for all that you do for us. We ask all these things in your precious and heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, next is set the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Mr. Moore, second by Mr. Meadows. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes. We have one item on the consent agenda. Are there any questions there? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Ms. Harris, second by Ms. Shoemaker. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, first item on our agenda is presentation regarding a proposal for developing the property located at 725 Elm Street, uh, Crescent Pictures. Is there anyone here to present for them? Okay. All right. We'll move on to number two. Uh, presentation regarding a uh, proposal developing property located at 725 Elm Street, Catawba Riverkeeper. We'll share. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Don't give me any updates on the game because I'll be here. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah, I know. Hmm? Yeah. Are we going to be heard okay without the microphones? If we speak well, we will hear you, but nobody watching online will hear you. Okay. And they really like it when they can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> well, we're going to spend most of our time off the screens, but uh, everything that's in our presentation is provided in print to you in your books. We're going to spend more of our time talking about uh, some of our overview plans. My name is John Searby. I'm the executive director of Catawba Riverkeeper Foundation, and thank you for allowing us uh, an opportunity to present our vision for your property at 725 Elm Avenue. Uh, what we envision for this space is a very uh, interactive campus that engages uh, two vital parts of your city property now. The new canoe kayak launch uh, that you just completed with Duke Energy on the Catawba, and River Street Park. As you know, this property sits right between those two, and we have a vision to turn this into an entire uh, environmental education, outdoor recreational corner at the confluence of these two important bodies of water. One of the things that we have done in this uh, project is we've tried to think about the existing programs that Catawba Riverkeeper has in place and bring those from all across the basin, all across the Charlotte region into one um, very cohesive site. Uh, this project would be transformative for our organization. And as we have approached this project, we have incorporated uh, several uh, important partners. Um, we have uh, a couple of those partners with us tonight. Uh, John Church is a developer here in Gaston County, has been working with us on this project. Um, and we have a representative of the rowing community who's also been working with us on this project. Um, our board of, of uh, directors has approved our pursuit of this project and we're excited to share this vision. Instead of walking you through every page of our 21 page proposal there, we'll let you read that through. We thought it might be a little more fun tonight to kind of share with you how this property would be used on a normal week in June once we have acquired it and activated it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brandon Jones. I'm your Catawba Riverkeeper, uh, native of Gastonia. Um, kind of started off the week, Monday morning. Obviously, the staff are going to show up, so we've got a staff of five as well as uh, the local artists and residents. Uh, so we'll come into the offices, 
right over here. Um, additionally, on Monday morning, uh, the summer camper is going to be dropped off. Uh, so we're operating summer camp, so they'll come in, drop off the kids, they'll be using all the different educational places. Uh, and then we'll head over to the boathouse on this side, we'll restore the supplies from the cleanups uh, that we did the previous weekend. Uh, Monday night, uh, there's room over here in the event center uh, for the Gas and Arts Council meeting. Tuesday morning, our summer campers are going to return to campus and they're going to be studying ecology. We envision turning the main building here uh, of the water treatment center into a space that has classroom space on the second floor that can also be uh, on the uh, outdoor patios. So our summer campers are going to start inside, move out to the patio, and then finish their afternoon down on the water doing water quality testing and learning about the ecology of the Catawba River. <clears throat> Tuesday night, we're going to invite the local neighbors. If uh, those of you are familiar with the site, there's a lot of houses around River Street Park. We're going to invite the neighbors uh, from that area to come in for their monthly neighborhood association meeting uh, in the community room that would also be on the second floor of the main building. On Wednesday, uh, buses from the Stowe YMCA come in and uh, drop off the kids. They then head down to uh, use the kayaks and kayak down in uh, Dutchman's Creek and then down on the main stem of the Catawba there. Uh, Tuesday afternoon, we receive a pollution report, similar maybe to the uh, spill we had this afternoon over on Long Creek. Instead of the 45 minute drive we currently had to get to our boat, we were able just to go five minutes down the road, launch at Bobby's Ramp uh, and get to the site uh, much quicker. Uh, it's Wednesday nights, uh, the artist in residence has a uh, wine and design class out here on the patio. Thursday is a big day for us at Catawba Riverkeeper during the summer. It's the day that our swim guide program uh, sampling happens. This is testing for swimming areas all across the basin. So our interns uh, are going to take off uh, from their location and bring samples back from the, the six major reservoirs across the basin to our lab, which will be housed on the first floor of the main building. In this lab, we're going to test for water quality and determine uh, if it's safe to swim, not only on Lake Wiley, but across the basin. Thursday evening, we're going to take a program that we're currently doing in various locations, including Tail Race Marina, and we're going to uh, bring our Thursday night paddle series to Dutchman's Corner. After uh, folks uh, grab a paddle and a kayak and head down to the Catawba for an hour or so, food trucks will greet them here and the tap room will be open on the second floor for them to enjoy a food truck uh, dinner and, uh, and a cold beverage uh, on a nice summer afternoon. On Friday, uh, the results from all the lab work are in. Uh, we were able to determine that it is safe to swim at all the major reservoirs. Uh, we post those results on social media and our website. You know, last summer, we just did this on Lake Wiley and we had over 7,000 views. Um, so we're hoping to get a lot more people involved in this and let a lot more people know that it's either safer or not safe to go swim in, in the waters around them. Um, also on Friday in the event space, we have the wrap up for our summer camp. And so we have a display of, of all the crafts that the kids made throughout the week, an opportunity for the parents to see what the kids have been doing. Um, and then on Friday nights, uh, we have our YAR, which is our Young Allies of the Riverkeeper, our Young Professionals group. Um, they come out and do a moonlight paddle out on the river. On Saturday, we're bringing our rowing uh, club into the space, takes the opportunity uh, to get out on the water in the morning before there's a lot of traffic, uh, take a row up to the Mountain Island Dam, turn around and row the little over a mile back. Uh, as the day progresses, uh, we'll activate our open adventure play area where kids can come, get their hands dirty, play uh, on the playground there. And then we'll hope, we'll hope that uh, disc golfers and other families from River Street Park will find their way over again to enjoy some food trucks, uh, take a kayak out for a paddle, uh, and enjoy the tap room. On Saturday night, um, we're going to uh, partner up with the local uh, Artist Guild and host an artist exhibition in the event space, followed by a concert on our stage here behind the building. Uh, Sunday morning starts off with a master's rowing race. Uh, so participants start up at the Mountain Island Dam, row right <coughs> down uh, to the finish line right here at the North Highway 27 bridge. Um, that afternoon, area residents come over from the park, explore the campus, and then really utilize the trails around the area to walk their dogs, just have a nice Sunday afternoon outside uh, looking at the art in the area. 
So to give you, uh, in conclusion, before we open it up for some questions, um, we really envision this having four main areas. A boathouse, taking the existing footprint of the storage that is on the site, uh, increasing that to a space that's large enough to accommodate rowing skulls uh, for both public use and club use, uh, kayak and stand-up paddleboard renters, rentals that we would have open uh, daily for uh, access to the public. The second major space is the event space, the existing and large storage building. We envision staying very flexible and open and available for events of all kinds. In the main building, we envision this uh, transforming on the first floor into the Catawba River Keeper headquarters, office space, labs, place for our volunteers to work. And on the second floor, a space for artists to have a, a work space, a community room, and a large uh, educational classroom. And then on the very end of the second floor, a tap room that would be open during regular business hours. Uh, the patio, the pool, would be transformed into an outdoor patio that would overlook our concert stage and our open kids' play area. Lastly, we really envision the site as being an active site, something that folks can move around, an environmental education trail that has public art pieces, has a connection over to River Street Park and a connection down to the kayak and canoe launch on the Catawba River. Be happy to answer any questions uh, <clears throat> about anything that you have in your packet or anything we've talked about this evening. Does Council have any questions? <clears throat> Mr. Moore? You talked about Dutchman's Creek and paddling up through Dutchman's Creek. Will there be any kind of cleanup along Dutchman's Creek at all because there's a lot of debris and just mess in there that need to be you know eradicated yeah one of the reasons we love this location is because it is on Dutchman's Creek for those of you who have lived here a while you know Dutchman's Creek is one of the more impaired creeks in Gaston County and for us to have our eyes and hands on it on a day-to-day -day basis we think we can improve the quality of that uh, being a, uh, a nonprofit entity, we have access to uh, stream restoration grants and things like that that we can activate. Um, and, and being right there on the banks, we really think we can improve not only some of the debris and trash that's uh, started to develop there, but start to document the water quality as well. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Mr. Meadows? A couple. Um, so we, we don't have an RFP and RFQ on the street, so this was just kind of an unsolicited offer. So um, a couple of questions come to mind. I don't know if you guys will be able to answer some of these or not, but, but I'll try. So one is, do we know a fair market value of, of the site? Does anybody, I don't know if our broker's in the room. If, he is. Sure where, to, where to go with that one, because it- Sam, if you could come, do you have an answer? If not, we can- I'd If like not, it's one. fine. You're in the room, we got that. All right. I'm in the room. Okay. I, the, the tax value is approximately five hundred fifty thousand dollars. The property was priced with the idea that um, we were hopeful that we were partnering with someone to make something great. It's a, it's a little bit elusive to give a fair market value. Okay. So just to repeat for those online, five hundred fifty thousand is the tax value. Okay. So what's the fair market value estimated at? Those are two different things, right? For an aggressive young man like yourself, what what would the <laughs> market value be for that property? I, I think that it is priced at a fair market value based on what it means to use it properly. So I, I, I don't know the number. I just said three hundred and forty nine thousand. Thanks. I didn't hear him. Three hundred and forty nine thousand. Okay. Yes, sir. So the ownership you said you're a non profit, will this be owned? By a for profit or a non profit? Uh, we would set up a uh, wholly owned for profit subsidiary um, to own the property itself uh, that, that we would be the, the sole partner of, but because of that, um, would, would give the city the opportunity to uh, levy taxes, the county the opportunity to levy taxes on that. So the property would return to the tax rolls, is that what I understand? Correct. Anyone else have any questions? Mr. Meadows? So um, so I guess I kind of asked, so will you be paying property tax on the property 
and what structure are you kind of talking about there? There's some stuff in the, the write-up that I kind of wanted to better understand. Yeah, so um, we intend to uh, set up a, an LLC to purchase this property uh, if, our, if our offer is approved and um, the LLC would retain ownership of the property. And the Catawba Riverkeeper Foundation would lease from the LLC. And we would be the sole partner of the LLC as well. So you'd be paying full property taxes? Correct. Okay. So are you referring to the variance in property tax for 10 I'm years? I understand, yeah. It sounds like a developer who has experience with this. John, is that your idea? I'm just, not that I'm putting you on the spot, but I know you've had a lot of experience with the Chronicle Mill and, and others. If you got, if you want to speak, please come up. Yep. I don't mean to, to call him out, but I know he might be able to here. address that yeah. more than. Yeah, I, uh, I'm John Church. I've been, uh, I've lived here in Gaston County for 23 years. I've been in the commercial real estate industry 40 years. Um, worked on Wall Street, Main Street, uh, done a lot of development here in the county, and my most recent project is the Chronicle Mill. And um, I decided to take that journey on uh, uh, eight years ago. So that just kind of gives you a time span of what it takes when you take on a property that's contaminated. Um, potentially, um, that, that process is usually um, discounted into the valuation process. So for example, the tax value is one way to look at it. Uh, another one is fair market value, which you might be just look at the fair, you know, the building and the property. But a buyer is going to look at this property and say, what is, I, what, are, what is it going to take for me to uh, get this property operating in a way that I can use it um, in a profitable manner? So if that means I have to get a brownfield agreement uh, to um, operate the property because it's contaminated and the cost of that. Um, I can tell you that in my experience is that the time and the money to um, remediate a property is an unknown and a lot of buyers won't take on that risk and whoever you do decide to buy that property should have the capacity to do that. And what I like about uh, when, when John came to me and told me about what he was doing, I got really excited about it because they look like the perfect buyer for this property because they're in this space. They've been operating for 20 plus years. They got a great membership base. They've got revenue. Um, they need a home. Uh, they're looking for a place on the river. They've got all this, these great ideas about how to use the property. Plus the most important part is that they can get grants which will clean up this property and also get members to potentially give money to do that. So, um, you know, I'm not assuming that it is contaminated, but. Yeah, hold on one John, second, John. Yes, Mr. Meadows. So, so I've read through the LOI as well. Has a, any kind of environmental review been done, a phase one at all? No, we, have you guys done one? We haven't, so there seems to be some assumptions that, I'm looking at your LOI, which I know we haven't presented, so I'm just trying to get a handle on the structure and why when we and don't know some of those answers just yet well that Mark, typically Mark. that typically goes when you accept a contract then the fire and the, the environmental phase one's done you don't do it beforehand i just want to make sure y'all didn't know something i don't go in well it just i guess let me clarify our perception from some of the comments okay um if i can is just um there seems to be an a i guess an allusion to there being some contamination that we're not familiar with so we didn't know if you were privy to something we weren't no um that is out of Planning. an abundance of caution gotcha um, okay. we have we have seen uh and been uh, familiar with cleanup sites on water treatment and wastewater treatment plants and one that's 100 years old uh, like this one is is very difficult to know until you do the phase one how much you have so um, some of the language in our LOI is very intentionally to try to um, protect ourselves from not getting too far out over our skis on something that neither the city nor us knows what's uncovered. And part of the reason we structured it that way was so that um, if we do find something during the phase one, um, that we can start to determine how much is that going to cost, what do we need to take on. If we don't, then there's then then the, the risk is gone for both of us which is is a good thing 
Okay, Mr. Meadows. A question related to that. So, my, what is a standard due diligence period to look at a property? What? If that's a broker question, or if that's y'all's question. Days. It, that can turn into two years. Was I mean, if you, if that you was, do it, it wasn't a, assertive. I just have to see if they can hear you. Okay. We're not worried about you being assertive, Sam. <laughs> Thank you. 60 days. I think the reason you're wanting 12 months is for this reason is the potential of what you well, may find. Yeah, I mean, I think just for all parties that are involved, the, it would give everybody a lot more flexibility uh, to the extent that, you know, that the due diligence period is uh, in 30 days or 60 days, they find out there isn't any problem, then we move ahead. And, and that's a that's a positive. On the other hand, once you do find something, it took with me on the Chronicle, for example, we had to do remediation and fig, you know, do test sampling. And, there was, and, and, and the reason why we had a problem was that there was always some substations that we didn't know was there. When you, you look at the Sanborn maps at land, sometimes you realize what was done there before, you didn't know that was there. So when you go back and look at the maps to see what was there and how it was used, and uh, it just takes time and money to do that work, and I think um, if you do find something, then it's going to take a phase two. And then if you do find a phase two, and what's nice about, I think, again, the Catawba River Keepers, that they have people on their staff or their, their board that has that experience. They have people that are in that business. So, you know, I, I, you know and again, I apologize. I don't presume that it is contaminated, but a water treatment plant typically on a river, and I know, we know Dutchman Tree, Dutchman's Creek is has problems we've already talked about it so I'm not trying to uh, presume anything but I'm just saying given what I know and probably what's going to happen is it's going to cost some money to probably do that they have the experience they got a board that has environmental people on it they've got the uh, membership uh, the agenda the mission to really activate this property so I just think it's a, a great partnership here and um, you know Hopefully it'll take less than 12 months, but give yourself time to do that. If it doesn't, um, great, move forward. If it does, then you've given yourself the time and flexibility to, to, to kind of figure it out. Mr. Meadows. So, so when someone puts a contract on a property and has a due diligence proper, due diligence period, do they control your property for that period of time? I'm sorry, what? Do they control your property for that period of time? Well, I think what, what we're proposing, and John can help me with this, but is that they were willing to really start activating the property now by using it as a, uh, a boat launch. And they'll pay you while they're doing their due diligence. That's normally, people don't do that. I mean, my experience is that I think they're trying to say, we're willing to invest, get on the property, start to figure out what it is, get, a, get some, some interest in it, figure out you know what they need to do to get it um, cleaned up, activated, and um, repurposed. To your, answer your question, typically no, we do not. We would not control your property during the due diligence. It's just a lease. You would just agree on ac allow us access for the um, for the uh, on-site testing and other things. But the lease, though, I think it's important to note, a lease is a they have rights to the property. So if you sign a lease with Catawba River Keepers, there are you just have to have your attorneys look at it and realize what you agreed to do and not do. So. One thing I would say, Mr. Meadows and, and Council, is um, we would not want a 12-month due diligence period to be a deal breaker on this. If, if this is something that you all are excited about our vision and where it could go, and you want us to try to speed that process up, we'd be comfortable with an agreement with a shorter due diligence period. Um, with an understanding that if the phase one comes back and determines that it is going to require uh, more work into a phase two that we would want to revisit that and extend it. We are going to lean on, uh, as John mentioned, some of our board members who work in the environmental engineering space to help us get through the phase one. Um, and so I think if, if there was flexibility on your end about what we find and working through that, then there would be flexibility on our end to not tie it up in a 12 month due diligence. I'm, I'm going to ask a question if it's okay. Um, so a couple things. I don't see a, where a lease is mentioned in any of the things that we have. So I wasn't aware you were leasing the property from us. We, we pulled that out of our uh, the one uh, 
Uh, John didn't see it. It's okay, it. John. Sorry. Uh, we, I mean, it threw me off, so I had to start yeah, reading again. We pulled that out of our, our final uh, LOI that we submitted because we, um, we understand that the upset bid process would not – if we did a lease with a purchase option later, that that upset bid process would not be triggered until the actual purchase went in. So we felt like it was better to – I'd probably do it on the front end. Leave the lease out. Yeah, probably yeah. a good idea. Okay, Mr. Meadows, sorry. I just wanted to have it on the record. My questions are on the business deal. They're not a commentary on the presentation, but yeah. it's hard to evaluate a concept if you don't understand the business term. So my question is more on your LOI. I mean, I, I like the presentation. I, I like the concept. I like the idea, but you, at least for me, I, I have to look at the business deal before I can start talking about whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So I just want to make sure it's clear that I'm, I'm not trying to be obstinate. I'm trying to understand the business deal so you can evaluate what you're putting in front of us. Sure. Just for the record. And, and we were given, we were told specifically not to discuss the business deal in this presentation. So, you know, but I'll take any questions you want. It's in the public record, so it's kind of hard to, to not deal with it. So, yeah. Ms. Shoemaker? Um, I, I see in the LOI that there's a, like a fairly substantial investment that's being proposed here. And obviously um, what you've what you put forward is, I mean, you know, there's a lot of change, a lot of growth, a lot of building, construction, all these things. Um, what would you, like, are the funds available? Um, is that something that you're gonna have to like raise the funds for? Is there like a, a time period, a time frame that we would expect? I just, you know, kind of hate to go into this and it'd be like six years from now before anything gets done, you know? Yeah, that's a, a fair question. And I think it's, uh, it's a little difficult for me to give you a specific time frame. Sure. We do envision that the development of this property would be done in phases. Um, for us, uh, because of the way we operate on a day-to-day -day basis now, the existing storage building and the existing um, uh, original water treatment plant with very minimal uh, changes would be functional for our needs. The um, the first priority for us would be to build a new boathouse because that is a, an activity option for us that we don't have right now as far as a home for our kayaks uh, in our monitoring boat. The most uh, complicated and cost, uh, costly portion of this project is going to be transforming the second floor uh, and the patio into that space. So um, if you've been in this building, there's two large pool rooms on the second floor. Um, that were uh, originally for the treatment of the water when it, uh, when it came in. Um, those are gonna be floored over and turned into large open rooms. Um, that and the uh, decking of the pool on the, uh, on the second floor there is gonna be the most costly part of this project. So we have in our mind that this is a three-phase project. We secure the property, we get it functional for our day-to-day um, the funds uh, to do that um, are, are, are close at hand, I will say. Um, not sitting in the bank, but close at hand. We've been talking about this with people for several months. Um, phase two would be to build the boathouse, and phase three would be to finish the rest of the property. I honestly don't know if that's a two-year project, a four-year project, five-year project. Um, we would be fundraising capital funds for that and, and applying for grants and foundation support for that. Okay, Ms. Um Just just to clarify, so the um, the rentals of like the paddle boards and the kayaks would be in your first phase, so you'd be open to the public for that as pretty much as soon as you are there? Correct, we, we own a fleet of uh, kayaks right now, and so uh, our intent would be that as soon as we get access to the, or we have ownership of the property, that we could be renting kayaks immediately. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Do you have an estimate of what that phased plan might build out for? Uh, total. So our, our kind of very, we think very liberal estimate for the entire project uh, including the purchase price of the site is just under $4 million, about three and a half million of that being the um, uh, development beyond accessing the site. Um, I think that's a little, uh, I think that's a little high personally. That's, a, that's an architect's estimate, not a contractor's estimate. Um, but we feel like we can, uh, we can do this between two and three million of capital improvement. Mr. Meadows? 
can you explain to us what your food and beverage plan is for the site? Yeah, so our food and beverage plan is, uh, for those of you who have been in this building, on the west end of the second floor, um, there is a, a, a room along there that our intent is to sublease that as a tap room, build it out uh, at our expense and sublease it as a tap room, uh, ideally to uh, a local uh, proprietor who wants to operate that. Um, and then we would uh, support um, uh, food truck access uh, any number of sites uh, here. Right now we're showing it um, adjacent to the event space so that we would have access there. Um, but that is not a totally baked plan. Right now that's kind of our vision because we don't necessarily um, have the expertise to you know, run a kitchen, but um, we would also be pursuing um, partners in that space as well. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is a presentation regarding the purchase of the annex property, the old police department. Uh, Billy Rick. <coughs> I'd like to thank council for the opportunity um, and the time to be here tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Billy Rick. I'm here on behalf of my wife, Anna, and the three businesses that we own uh, and operate in Mount Holly. Um, <clears throat> I would like to leave it open to any questions as we go. I want to make sure that we get anything answered tonight and don't want to miss something that somebody has a question about thinking we can come back to it, if that's okay. <clears throat> I'm here tonight to present a proposal to purchase the property at 129 South Main Street. Get a picture of the front of it. Hmm? The picture of the front of the building. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which is owned by the city of Mount Holly. <clears throat> the main use of this property would be to expand Jack Beagle's dining and indoor seating area. The official proposal letter has been delivered to both the city manager, Danny Jackson, and assistant city manager, Miles Braswell. I understand that everyone on council had received that uh, proposal. Um, <clears throat> We'd like to start with a little bit of background about who we are and what we've been doing in Mount Holly. We own three commercial properties on South Main Street. We operate three businesses from there. We have invested a little over $1.5 million into those properties to date. The first of which we opened in May of 2007, the Salon and Spa Main LLC, which is owned and operated by my wife, Anna, and there are 13 full-time employees that work there. We have expanded and remodeled the salon twice since opening in 2007. We also own and operate RTR Renovations, has six employees, and RTR Property Management, which has three employees. Within the three properties, we have 12 total tenants and employ approximately 65 total people in those spaces. <clears throat> Between the 12 tenants, we're averaging approximately 2,000 people per week coming through those properties. The biggest chunk of that number comes from recent opening of Jack Beagles. Some of the tenants include the Salon and Spa on Main, which has expanded twice, the Vintage Nest, which is now in their third location because they continue to grow, and also On Track Yoga, which is also in their third location. <clears throat> we have been members of the Mount Holly Community Foundation on the Mount Holly Economic Development Committee, previous board member for Mount Holly Chamber of Commerce, current member of Mount, Mount Cross Area Chamber. I have served on the subcommittee that created the Business Incentive Grant and also on the Economic Development Committee that helped create the Mount Holly logo. <clears throat> there have been 17 Business Incentive Grants awarded to businesses. We have been a part in some way of eight of those, either as the GC or expansion improvements to our own properties. 
RTR Renovations was voted 2014 Business of the Year by the Mount Holly Chamber of Commerce. Why do I say all this? <clears throat> Just to give you some background on who we are and what we've done, but most importantly to show you our commitment to Mount Holly and the businesses that are here. <clears throat> when we first opened the Salon and Spinal Main in 2007, there were a lot of vacant and rundown buildings in downtown Mount Holly. People questioned why we chose Mount Holly instead of other places. We saw the potential of what Mount Holly could be one day, and now we are really proud to be a part of Mount Holly and the growth that continues. A little information about Jack Beagles. General Manager Dave Laddish is here with us on behalf of Jack Beagles and ownership. <clears throat> Jack Beagle Enterprises is a mid-sized company which brands across uh, Gaston and McNamara counties. We, they currently have three locations of Jack Beagles, two in Charlotte, one in Mount Holly. They are owners of Mayor's Public House in Cramerton and Stuart Kramer at Cramer Mountain Country Club. <clears throat> they also have a concept called Stool's Barrel House in Charlotte. In 2019, Jack Beagles did fi over $5.3 million in sales across six stores and currently employ over 120 people. <clears throat> They recently signed a new five-year lease extension at Maywurst and actively trying to purchase that building. Jack Beagles in Mount Holly currently employs 20 people and plan to increase over $1 million of sales in 2020. <clears throat> we feel that adding the space next door would be key to their continued success. Not only will it be adding more seating capacity to better serve the community, but also be adding more jobs to cover the new space. Jack Beagles has already made a significant investment in the Mount Holly community and will make it more of an investment if they're able to secure the space next door. <clears throat> With addition to space next door, Jack Beagles and Mount Holly will have more fun and vibrant place for all to visit. Jack Beagles Mount Holly location opened late summer 2019. Total investment and cost open from myself and from the owners is approximately $522,000. currently employ 20 people and serving around 1,600 customers per week, which is great. It can be a lot more with a space, with more space for seating. Uh, if anybody's been in there on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday afternoon, they're constantly turning away um, guests or customers because there's just not enough seating. Uh, it's, I think it's been uh, more successful than we had thought it would be. Um, the plan would be in the new space to add 15 to 24 to six top, table, six top tables and could potentially serve another 2,200 customers per week with additional space. And some of the slides that are coming through are the renderings that we've done just to kind of get a feel for what our plan would be with the space uh, inside, outside on the patio. Um, some of the patio renovations that we had planned to do in the beginning uh, shade cells, some outdoor lighting and stuff. Uh, we're kind of holding on uh, probably till spring and also see how this uh, proposal works out. So we end up with the uh, indoor seating inside. It may change a little bit of the plan on the patio. The additional space could also be used, also be used for special events and private parties. <clears throat> we have a letter of intent from the owners of Jack Beagles to lease this additional space located at 129 South Main Street. Plans, plans for the space. Uh, upper floor and front patio would be used in extension of Jack Beagles. Uh, we've already spent approximately $50,000 on the patio alleyway bridge, etc. cetera. Uh, interior renovations would include adding two ADA restrooms, new bar area, approximately 20 uh, additional tables for seating, removal of the drop ceiling and replacing it with some kind of wood ceiling, um, new flooring, lighting, HVAC, and electrical improvements. Estimated cost to improve that area will be $125,000. The basement area will be shared office space for RTR renovations, uh, RTR property management, Jack Beagles, and the salon and spiral main. Improvements would include making the rear entrance more inviting with new entry door, new windows, awnings, and planter boxes. Interior renovations would include uh, remodel existing restroom, 
new flooring, doors, trim, lighting, HVAC, electrical, and plumbing uh, improvements as needed. Estimated costs, the basement renovation would be $75,000. Alleyway improvements uh, would include uh, new lighting, planters, benches, art, and wall murals to make the alleyway more inviting. Estimated costs on the alley work would be approximately $10,000. would like to do something still kind of kicking around some ideas about the old jail to save that and do something that would uh, honor the uh, history of the jailhouse there part of the proposed proposal to purchase uh, the property is to only purchase the building and the patio towards Main Street and the city would retain ownership of the parking lot uh, in the rear of the building and part of that proposal also would be to give the city ownership of the two parking lots that we have behind our building at 123 through 127 and also the small sliver that's behind 121 south main which is now on track yoga and so then the, the green shaded area would be owned by the city and we would ask the city to do similar improvements to the parking lot as they done on North Main Street. With the curbing, landscaping, lighting, restriping the parking lot, refaving the parking lot. The city would own, the city would maintain that parking as part of the proposal. Uh, had probably two or three different people look at the parking lot because <clears throat> either in part or in whole, right now there's 42 parking spaces between the old city hall building, the annex building, and our parking space, our parking lot. Uh, the number I get back that we should be able to add 12 to 15 parking spaces if that parking lot is redone and combined as one parking instead of three different ones, um, they looked at as one total project, we should be able to add 12 to 15 parking spaces, which if you've been downtown lately, I think we're getting to the point we could use it. We also had applied for a um, zoning permit um, probably a couple years ago now for a, we applied as a storage building in the very back part of the parking lot um, that we currently we own. Um, we've, we've held up with that after they did the uh, strategic vision plan and saw some of the really cool ideas and thoughts that people had and about more infrastructure uh, in the downtown area. Uh, kind of rethought the storage building area and thinking it could be a, a better use space in that building. What we're showing there on the rendering is uh, like two or three live workspaces that could be uh, built back there or additional office or some kind of additional commercial space back in that area. So it's, showing, it's shown there on the rendering as a uh, building back there in the back. <clears throat> Before we wrap this up, the other part of, uh, of this, I know that 129 is currently partially occupied by the Historical Society. And we've uh, looked at the property a couple times with uh, um, <clears throat> employees of the city, let us in to look at it. Also looked at some sp uh, areas inside the old city hall, the chamber area, and some other places that's not being utilized. And we were asked if this, um, would move forward if we could assist in doing any renovations or improvements to the I think it's 131 South Main area to help the historical society to be able to use that space uh, would we be willing to do so and yes we would definitely be willing to do so um, at, you know, anything that we could help out with that okay Council, have any questions for Mr. Rick? Mr. Moore? The uh, green area shown here the, uh, that you're talking about turning over to the city, the entire parking, is there an estimate on what it would cost to renovate that space? <coughs> uh, I, don't, um, I don't know. Uh, Y'all just did North Main. Y'all probably have a better idea than me. Um, I, I've 
my thought originally was around two hundred thousand, but I think I heard it figured it maybe it cost the cost for North Main was more than that. I, I don't I don't know what that number was over there. I don't know how it compares in size um, and utility. Um, it seemed like there, from what I saw and remember about it, there was a lot of utilities to go underground. Uh, maybe a big drainage, also. Um, there's currently two um, utility poles that are in the back parking area. One would be could be moved pretty easily. I've actually talked to Duke about uh, moving that one before because we've had people run into it. Uh, the other one, there's a lot of stuff that comes into that one. Um, if it couldn't be moved, I think we could incorporate it into like a median area. Uh, with landscaping and things to keep that cost down. Um, I, you know, since I wasn't involved with the North Main, I don't know what all went into. I know that was a big part of it, and that held things up a lot was the utility work. Miles, could you uh, remind us how much it was for the other parking lot? And I'm yes. not sure we've done any work on where this would might be different. All right, we hadn't done any estimation on this one right here, but for the North Main lot, it was close to five hundred thousand dollars, but like Billy was talking about, there was a lot of utilities above overhead that we had to drop down below. A lot of stormwater work that we did, so uh, I'm not really sure about any kind of stormwater work in this area either. So I don't really have a good estimate for this, but just as a comparison, the other one was around five hundred thousand. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Moore. Miles, could you tell us how many parking spaces are in that uh, lot at North Main? I think eighty. I think we got 80, 80 at the end of the day. Oh. Yes, sir. Okay. 80, and you said there were how many at this one, possibly? Uh, right now we have four, there's 42 between our parking lot and the two small way they got it uh, striped out between behind the old city hall building and uh, behind the annex uh, building 129. <clears throat> and you said if it was reconfigured, we could maybe get another 10 or 12 more. I've had three different contractors look at um, different options. As some of you guys know, I've been kicking this thing around uh, so many different ways where we would buy the property, we would retain the parking lot, we would agree to do uh, so much parking lot work. So we looked at it from that angle also, and I haven't totally closed the door on that, but um, the thought was that the city could own and city could control the parking in downtown that works better for everybody. Um, so 15 to 20 is what I heard? I, I, I heard 12 to, 15. 12 to 15. And it depends on how much medians, how much natural area how all that plays in into it also the other thing would be nice to have there if we did the parking lot would be a the uh, dumpster pad and enclosure uh, like they have they did down at uh, north main um, i think we had a picture of that somewhere but um, really neat and clean uh, versus i think right down the real parking lot there's about 40 something trash cans sitting around everywhere some of them get put back some don't they're scattered out you know from one week to the other from one end of the parking lot to the other um, and they take up a lot more room than this uh, dumpster pad would, and just cleaner and neater and just looks better. Mr. Meadows. You mentioned the Historical Society. Have they been consulted about this plan, and how do they feel about that renovation space? Has there been any exchange with them? Yeah, I, I haven't personally spoken to anyone from, well, directly about the proposal. I think there's been some conversations with other people, some feedback uh, from some of the people who are so excited, but I personally have not um, had any kind of meeting or um, anything with them. Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. There's been some preliminary conversation, if you will, with certain members of the Historic Society in the past. However, to this degree, no conversation has taken place with this proposal, that's where we stand right now. Mr. Meadows. So again, for the record, this is also an, another unsolicited offer. I, I don't know if we have any idea what the fair market value of the space is. That's something we would need to understand. Do you have any idea? I don't think this has been with our broker, so I don't know. We, um, part of the uh, research and stuff we've done, we've, uh, it's, been a hard thing to figure out because we're talking about buying the property without the parking lot also giving up um, our parking which is um, more than 50 percent of the land that goes with our building and also giving up the uh, small sliver of uh, parking area that's behind 121 um, I think we 
we um, worked off of some comps. Uh, we just recently had our building um, appraised because we refinanced or pulled some equity out to uh, do the Jack Beagles project. So based on that and some other projects that we've worked on or with in downtown, um, and being able to uh, create or pull some comparisons from those um, using tax value of some of it, uh, just a lot of different um, things that we've kind of pulled together. Um, but with the property swap or giving up, um, you know, the parking lot that we have, um, I, I don't really know how to nail down a complete number. It, it, what The number that's on the proposal wasn't something I just pulled out of the air and said this is a good number that works for me. Uh, I tried to come up with a number that uh, works for us that uh, we can continue to put another $200,000 into the property plus and I feel like it's a fair number for the city uh, for what the prop what's there and with the city retaining that, that part behind it and us giving the rear part of our uh, property to the city. Mr. Meadows? You already beat me to the one. I was going to ask you how much your investment was in the property. So thank you for sharing that. Um, what would your timing be, if, say, if all this worked out? How long would it take you to get this on the ground? I think in the proposal we asked for 120 days due diligence. Uh, I, I don't think that we need that since we've we've looked at the property um, a handful of times. Uh, my lender, uh, local lender, Bank of Ozarks, he's been out with me. We've met. He's seen the renderings. We've talked about the lease from Jack Beagles. We've talked about the outfit from the basement. Um, I asked him for a letter, approval letter, but he said it's no better than paper it's on, so it didn't matter. But the funding is um, available. Uh, we have a tenant who's ready to go in there, a tenant who needs it as soon as possible. Um, it's a good question because I know it came up a lot about the time frame for Jack Beagles. Uh, you know, we kept getting asked, when is this open? When is this open? Uh, ran into a lot of hurdles with Jack Beagles being in the multi tenant building. Um, we had to re engineer a lot of the drawings uh, with the architect and the engineering um, as the project went. Um, we ended up spending a lot more money on the project than we had initially budgeted for uh, because of those things. And after the project had began, is when we went and um, <laughs> refinanced the property to pull additional equity out to help um, cover those expenses. This may be a question, I don't know if it impacts you or if it's our legal folks, but th there's a current lease on the property. How would that work into this? On, on which property are you speaking the, of? The patio area is leased. Okay, the patio. Okay. Yeah, yeah, part of the, um, when we signed the lease with the city, uh, we were going to, we were given credit for any improvements that we've did. I recently uh, gave those, uh, those numbers to Miles so he could calculate the uh, lease date. Um, I, I mean, I would assume that if, you know, if we purchased a property, that lease would go away. Uh, I mean, we would own the property and be, you know, I, I would assume that lease would, would go away. Uh, I will say this um, about the lease and about the purchasing the property. Uh, one of the things that has come up and does concern us a little bit is uh, the upset bid process. Um, I, I know that this, um, this property is not posted for sale, not listed for sale. Um, so uh, one of the concerns that we have is we're reaching out, inquiring about this, and trying to move forward with a proposal to purchase is that we open up an upset bid and um, similar to what happened up on North Main at the old fire station this thing gets out of reach for us and doesn't make sense for us financially and now we have somebody who purchases the building my lease with the restaurant or with the city then is void or gets bought out or when it's up they don't renew the lease to us and so, and so now instead of us expanding for the restaurant that we currently have we go backwards and we would probably lose the tenant that we currently have so that that's a concern and we've consulted with some different people um, about the upset bid and uh, about some possible ways to that and, and to protect our offer and our bid um, on that. The only reason I asked w was to make sure that, that if, if we decide to move forward with this, which my next question is kind of what are the next steps because it's an unsolicited offer, but I just want to make sure that if there were any I's that we needed to dot or t T's we needed to cross associated with the lease that we 
address that as part of the process. There's the only reason I asked. Well, I think if council gives direction to, to get more information on how you would move forward, we could uh, assign that to staff and our attorney uh, to give us next steps. I think, um, I think there's a couple uh, things we need to keep in mind. So the Historical Society has an exhibit uh, in the annex that was paid for, donated by the family, um, and they built that exhibit based on the wishes of the family. So that, I know uh, Mr. Rick had discussed the potential of helping the Historical Society in some area there, uh, and that may be to move that exhibit back over more in the chambers. In our discussion with Ms. Ball at the time and Mr. Brinkley, um, we we kind of went through some of their concerns. The other concern would be storage uh, for their um, archived items, the historical items that are in the bottom uh, in the basement. Um, so th some thoughts that we may want to consider as, as we look at this, if it's council's desire to see what the next steps look like would be uh, potentially uh, the city looking at, um, and I'm, I'm just, this is Brian talking, um, a storage controlled environment facility that they could store their items in that we would pay for um, so that, and, and work with them. They know better what they need than we do. And I, I'm not gonna answer for anyone who spent the type of time, money, effort, blood, sweat, and tears that these guys have done at the Historical Society. It's been a tremendous, tremendous job. So nothing that we're discussing here is intended to minimize any of the work that's been done. So uh, it's a difficult, it's a difficult, uh, I would call it a conundrum. Uh, we have a great historical society. We have a really good offer from a retail space for usage in a limited downtown. So, so it is difficult. But I think, uh, I think if we look at options that we try to mitigate some of these issues, for the historical society and see how we can work together. Another, and I have not discussed this with anyone, I'm throwing out ideas, valid concern about the lease, valid concern about the upset bid process. Uh, not even sure this would be entertained, but what about a lease on the building um, so you don't go through the upset bid process? Um, is there a possibility of lease to own that supersedes the, the upset bid process? I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm not an attorney. I didn't sleep at a Holiday Inn Express. So I don't, I don't have all the answers, but I think what we have to do is open the door to opportunities when they present themselves. You know, and look at, A, the vision plan, the park plan. How does this all come together in additional downtown public parking? How does it come together with establishing more restaurants and more restaurant space? Uh, and maintain our historic historical society and our legacy here in, in Mount Holly. So I think, I think we can come up with a workable solution. If that's the council's desire, um, then we could, we could look at it from that direction. Um, does council want to look at what the next steps would look like and get direction at our retreat? Yes. Okay, I'm getting a, a yes. So we'll look at next steps and uh, we'll, we'll talk about them on the 7th at our retreat. And then, you know, we may not come to a conclusion, but we'll continue discussing it. Does, does anyone have any other questions? Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, guys. it. Next item is a presentation from the Tar Heel Trailblazers regarding mountain bike trails. Mr. Jesko. Thank you, Mayor, Member, Members, Council. Uh, in 2018, the city of Mount Holly re, um, came to an MOU agreement with the Tar Heel Trailblazers to build and maintain mountain bike trails at our Mountain Island Park at Mount Holly. Uh, it's just past the uh, old part of the park where we did the, uh, the Greenway uh, extension. This is to the right-hand side. Um, they've been working on this current section, uh, section for about a year now, and we're about to open up... Um, a, a section and I'm going to introduce Mr. Bruce Euler from the Tar Heel Trailblazers to give you the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. While he's setting up, I will let y'all know you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but after they're finished, I'll give a five minute break because a number of you may be here for one item that's already been discussed. A lot of history, history people over here, you know, a lot of arts and trail people over here. So, uh, there might be a game on tonight you want to see. I don't know. 
I'm DVRing it myself. So. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Um, <clears throat> welcome. Thank you uh, for having me here. Um, just the, the trails at Mount Holly have been possible because of uh, the city of Mount Holly and their um, parks and rec staff have realized that the growing advantages of having trails incorporated into their master plan and um, with the help from the, um, our um, supporting partners and very generous donors uh, and especially the uh, local volunteers, uh, these trails have really started to take shape. As um, Mr. Jusko uh, introduced me, I'm, my name is Bruce Euler. I'm a member of the Trailblazers since 2019. I am a trail coordinator um, with, for the uh, Mountain Island um, Park since 2018, and I was previously a trail coordinator over at Rocky Branch Park um, from about, for about four years. Um, I'm also a I'm also a uh, committee member, a trail committee member on the, of the Trailblazers, and they are basically, they oversee all things trail for the Trailblazers. Okay. <clears throat> Why do we have mountain bike, uh, mountain bike and trails in Mount Holly? Well, mountain bike and trails were, were part of the bike plan along the Greenway. Um, they were conducted, uh, Mount Holly conducted a survey and found that over 50% preferred bike facilities in and among the greenways. Um, of that, 85% also agreed that the building more uh, bike facilities would encourage people to visit Mount Holly. Um, there are several cities that have now embraced mountain biking and trails um, upkeep and are now seeing the results of those um, investments. And a few of those examples are Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, Walton. Uh, the Waltons have put a, over $14 million into their trails, and they're seeing unbelievable growth there. Uh, Tannery Knob in Johnson City, um, Rocky Knob Bike Park up in Boone, um, Hickory Trails up in Hickory. All these cities have invested into their mountain biking uh, systems and are seeing great returns from those. Um, these trails have become a, a big economic uh, driver and because mountain biking is no longer a fringe sport, it's actually in the Olympics, it's X Games, um, and the demographic that mountain biking actually applies to can be a very affluent um, demographic. I mean, it's, you see people riding five, six thousand dollar bikes, There's, they also have money to spend um, eating out and going to these trails. Um, so, <coughs> Trailblazers, as I said, were invited and participated in the, in the Master Plan um, and Steering Committee. And in 2018, uh, Mount Holly uh, Parks and Recs and, and Trailblazers entered into an MOU to build mountain bike trails along the um, Greenway. So you may be wondering, okay, who are the Trailblazers and what is our mission statement? Our mission statement is to provide our community the best possible opportunities to enjoy mountain biking and trails. And how can we do this? Well, working with communities and cities and landowners, we entered into, enter into agreements where we help build, maintain everything trails we can help a city with. Uh, we do this with um, Charlotte Mecklenburg. We do it with um, all the Charlotte metro area. Um, we are constantly protecting and improving and maintaining our trails. Um, we have over, over 18 trail systems that we um, oversee and that adds up to about 200 miles of trails that the Tar Heel Trailblazers take care of. Um, we provide a, a very loud voice of, for ac ac uh, excuse me, advocacy, and we also are constantly looking for new locations, and these new locations are more supported by local, by local people like Mount Holly, where uh, mountain local people have shown, or shown interest in trails, and we um, help develop that. Um, we provide um, volunteer servicing services opportunity, and we're also a, a great source of information. Our website, this is just a picture, uh, a sample of our website, which is currently being redone to, to bring it a little more into the 2000, year 2000. Um, but it provides information about all the local trails, and it also provides whether trails are open or closed, um, and 
um, if they're good to ride. <clears throat> so who are the Trailblazers? Well, we are a 100% volunteer organization. Our current membership is about 475 members. We are a very diverse club. Our members are, include bankers, lawyers, contractors, bartenders, engineers, bike shop owners, and employees, basically all folks who just love doing things outdoors and especially riding bikes. We are a 501c3 organization, so what we, a lot of times we work with uh, cities to develop grants, and they were able to do the grants through, the, through our 501. We are also a member of SORBA and IMBA. SORBA is a, is a regional um, association. It's the Southern Off-Road Biking Association. And then we are also a member of IMBA, which is the inter, um, International Mountain Biking Association. And that's a national advocacy group for um, mountain biking and trails. <clears throat> We've been um, mountain bike and trail advocates since 1990. And for more information, as I said, you can go to our web website at uh, tarheeltrailblazers.com. <coughs> so let's talk about Mountain Island. For those that aren't um, familiar with it, the area that the trail, this is the area that the trails are being built, the area in the, um, in the blue along the river. It's 150 acres uh, on the Catawba River located below Mountain Island Dam. It's located at the end of Mountain Island Road. And what makes this so nice about um, for developing into mountain biking is that the, the wooded area that is, uh, um, has a very, um, all those squiggly lines are basically elevations and that makes mountain biking more fun and more appealing um, to build trail on. Just to simplify that, all those squiggles, basically there are about five uh, um, hills in this, in this 150 acres and that, we're able to, that we'll be able to build trails off of. And we estimate that we hopefully will have between eight to t 11 miles of trail when, we're, when we have this all built out. So, let's look at what we've got so far. Originally, we started with about a half mile green loop, which was a phase one trail. Um, we went, then went up the first hill to create another eight tenths of a, of a, a mile of interne intermediate loop. This was all done and completed in, in, early, in um, November of 2019. So it is rideable, people are enjoying it all the time. When we're out there working, it's con we're constantly seeing people uh, hiking, walking, riding bikes on it. And this is all off of the Greenway and the main entrance is, is roughly right by the first bridge if you follow the Greenway down. <clears throat> What we have, um, what we ha this is um, what we are currently working on and hope to have open in the spring of um, this year is this intersection, um, which will add another three quarters of a mile, bringing it us up to about two miles of single track. So this is um, also going to be a more of an intermediate um, where the green is more down around in the lower elevations, but um, it's, it's open and rideable for everyone. One of the things that um, at least me as a trail coordinator tries to do is whenever I'm building something that has a, a feature or a little more advanced, I always try to have a ride around or a go around so that other people can build up and progress to that feature um, as a um, ride. <clears throat> so that's where we are now. This is where we look to hope to be going. What I want in the next phase, what we're looking to do is to complete about a mile uh, and a quarter leg that runs the length of the current park that will kind of par run parallel to the existing thread trail. That's that green line. The red line is the, um, would be the thread trail and the green line would be the new, tr new uh, single track. This would allow um, beginners and intermediates and even advanced people to go deeper into the park and not have to ride on the greenway and they could now ride on single track and then come back in on the greenway. So it would still be one directional. So let's take a quick tour of, of, what we, of, the, of the trail. Um, as you come to the entrance, you'll see the, the, um, a, a map. And then this is just a quick ri ride through the park. <laughs> as you're going through the green section, you'll go across two major boardwalks. Then you cross over into the, the, uh, the, the, the creek and go start going up the hill, riding down, and finishing up at the first bridge where you can again do another loop if you want or you can continue on the greenway if you, if you care to. 
in the green loop, uh, we've done extensive woodwork. This is to make it more interesting, and it also is a boardwalk area to, because um, the green in the green area there is some low areas, and this is in case there there is some water retention. One of the things that's beautiful about this park is that the, the soil there just leaches out water incredibly fast. We have with all that rain that we just had um, Friday night. Saturday, we were the only park that was open because the trail was dry and ready to ride. So this, this ground here is, is great. There are a couple little low areas, and that's why we built this boardwalk. Um, one of the boardwalk is 110 feet long, and the other is 90 feet long. And it just provides some interesting stuff for the, for the user to use. Crossing over into the blue loop, going up the, up the side of the hill, you'll cross over a, a, um, a single bridge work your way up the hill, then you, you'll have another bridge that crosses one of those many ravines there. Working back around, there's some interesting, we have some curved bridges and other little boardwalks that, that um, provide just interest, makes it interesting for the hikers and walkers to, to go on. So what have we done so far? We've created um, about 1.2 miles of hand-built single track it's include, and if you include the, the Carolina Thread Trail section of it, it, brings you up to almost five miles of trail that's available there um, in, in the park. <clears throat> in that, we've created about 350 feet of wooden features that have been built, which is about $5,000 worth of material provided by the trailblazers and other donors that have, um, where it has not cost the city anything for this, uh, to build these structures. Um, some of the future things, uh, the other thing that also was on the National Trail Day, with the help of the U.S. Forestry Service, we also planted several hundred saplings that the Forestry um, Service provided. Um, so we're also always looking to try and you know, uh, leave no trace and um, increase, improve. Future projects. Uh, some of the future projects that we were doing besides this is actually we got, um, we were working with some local scout troops to have several eagle projects um, being built into, in the park, within the park. This includes a gateway for our entrance, which would be part of my rendering, but basically a, an archway with a nice kiosk, a bench, and that would allow a, a, a main entrance into the, into the trail system. And then also some bridges over some of the many uh, ravines and, and creek crossings that we would come across. Okay, so how is this all accomplished? <clears throat> well, it's accomplished with the, um, the using uh, local volunteers. These volunteers have contributed numerous hours of, um, to, to help build these trails at um, their own personal time, during the, using their own personal time. <clears throat> About 90% of this has been accomplished through volunteer help. A lot of the volunteers are actually here, and riders are here. Um, as I said, we've done it um, about, as TC, I have logged, I myself have logged about over 350 hours at the park um, doing work on the trails. Um, in 2019, we had over 600 volunteer hours combined. And since the park is, since we have entered into an MOU, we probably have over 750 volunteer hours total um, that have people that have put into creating this, this trail system. Um, for some more information, you can go to the uh, Trailblazers website. We also have a Facebook um, site that is um, MILTMTB, and there is also a YouTube channel. There's a YouTube um, um, that's set up by one of our local um, bike shops that um, did a nice YouTube video of, of the trail system showing the trail and, and, and the features of it. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your time and your support. I'd like to thank all the trail users who have also expressed their appreciation. Thank you very much. And I, the biggest thank you to all the volunteers who have helped to create these trails and have helped make this project go forward. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer any. Any questions from council? Other than say, wow.
<laughs> thank you. It's been a thank pleasure. You. It's no, been a pleasure you. doing doing this work, and um, I look forward to many more miles. So, thank you. Well, thank you for all the hard work. That's fantastic. Gives us another gym uh, in Mount Holly. So, thank you so much. You're quite welcome. We appreciate it. All right, we'll take five minute break. <clears throat> Yeah, I gotta go to Oh, you did? Yeah, put it on there. Yep, you got it.
I've met you once. You know, you were taller then, right? Uh, <laughs> hey, how are you? Good to see you. I know. I 
All right, we're going to get our meeting started back. If, uh, if you're leaving, leave. If you're staying, stay. It's all exciting because we all know each other. Good. How you doing? It's like a community meeting, you know? Right. Let's see, let's score. Yeah, do not do that to me. <laughs> Is your dad at your house waiting on you? Uh, we had Maddie's dog swallowed something she wasn't supposed to, and they had to have emergency surgery on her. She lives them. It was last night, and uh, they've been up all, all morning, so... Yeah, well, I don't have to pay for it. It's her right. girlfriend. <laughs> All right, we're back at our meeting. Uh, presentation on downtown Wi-Fi Open brand ba Broadband LLC. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. I'm Alan Fitzpatrick. I'm one of the founders of Open Broadband. We're a local company. We're an ISP, so we provide high-speed internet service. So I'm going to talk to you about the downtown Wi-Fi proposal for Mount Holly, and then a little bit of background about our company and how we got started and, and different ways you can consider this uh, Wi-Fi zone. Uh, our model is we provide very high-speed fixed wireless internet. You can see some of the pictures of antennas on the right side. Uh, we serve everyone. We serve government, we have business customers, we serve universities, residential. You'll see some pictures of our clients uh, as you go along. But uh, we're a regular ISP, so we compete with the AT&Ts and Spectrums of the world and other ISPs. I'm sorry, Alan. David, we really don't want to shut those, but I know why you want to shut them, but it's an open meeting, so we try to keep those doors open. Maybe one. We'll, we'll keep one open. How's that? Or tell the people to move the over. Noise. <laughs> Hush. Just to keep the noise down. Y'all right, go to there. the summit and talk there, or Jack Beagles or whatever. Gonna be throwing them out. <laughs> Chief is out there. He's got them. All right, Alan. Sorry. Okay. No, no problem. So uh, we are North Carolina owned and operated. So all of our employees are based in the state. So when we do business, uh, and you'll see a map of our uh, our service areas in just a minute. You'll see that uh, uh, we're very much focused on the state. Uh, we do believe in a public-private partnership. So we work with counties and towns across the state. Uh, whether it's Belmont or Mount Holly or a town of Sanford or Anger and some of our other partners. We got started back in 2014, 2015 in something that was called the Gaston Gigabit Initiative. This was uh, Tracy Philbeck and the county commissioners had wanted Gaston County to get really high speed internet. At the time, Google Fiber was making the big announcement about going into Charlotte and how they were going to roll out this really high-speed internet in Mecklenburg County, but Gaston County wasn't going to get it. So uh, what could we do to get faster internet speeds into Gaston County? So at the time, I was running a data center company uh, over near the airport, and someone had suggested to me, why don't you just go form an ISP and bring high-speed internet to Gaston County? So we did. So that was kind of the genesis of... Uh, open broadband. So in uh, the past four years, uh, we've done this. We've started building network from Rutherford County in the western part of the state to Duplin County and Wayne County in the eastern part of the state. So those dark green counties are where we have live customers. The uh, medium green counties are where we're building out network uh, from scratch. And the uh, teal counties that you see are ones that we're still in uh, conversations with, but we haven't launched uh, yet. So we are rapidly growing. We're taking uh, the concept of high-speed internet to as many North Carolinians as we possibly can, providing broadband at affordable prices and higher speeds than what people could get elsewhere. And we brought gigabit internet to Gaston County. So this is a screenshot from TechWorks uh, on Irvin Street in Belmont. It was uh, our first gigabit customer. This was a screenshot from our computer doing a speed test. Uh, my hunch would be most of you have never seen a speed test with numbers that high. I and mean, this is almost 1,000 megabits up and down. Uh, but this is what Google Fiber can do, and this is what we can do, and we're doing it here. Uh, these are a few of our customers. Uh, we have towns like uh, or city of Belmont that uses us at all their locations. So 
City of Belmont Town Hall, wastewater, fire department, police department, parks and rec, public works, wastewater, you know, they all use uh, open broadband. Uh, Town of Mount Olive does the same thing. We serve the University of Mount Olive, Pfeiffer University, Guilford Tech Community College up near Greensboro as a customer. We serve an airport outside of Mount Olive. Uh, if you uh, go to the Cotton Candy Factory or Cherubs restaurant in downtown Belmont, you'll be using open broadband internet. So these are just a few of our, our customers. Uh, I think I mentioned some of these already. City of Belmont and Mount Olive use us basically across their entire town. Uh, we just put in a gigabit wireless network for Lee County uh, in Sanford, connecting their different buildings together. They wanted to connect the Sheriff's Department, their county IT buildings, all together with a private network. And rather than pay for fiber costs every single month, we put in this wireless network that they own, that we installed, and they have gigabit connection between all of them. Uh, we serve police stations, fire departments, airports, college campuses. We even have a public housing community in Charlotte uh, called Dillahay Courts. We provide everybody in the public housing development free Wi-Fi. One of the ways that we deploy is putting up antennas on top of water towers. Uh, this particular one happens to be in Mount Olive, North Carolina. So on the left is what you see from the ground. What you see on the right is uh, some of our antennas. The largest of those is probably about a two foot in diameter. So relatively speaking to like cell phone antennas, these are a lot smaller. But these antennas basically serve the entire area around that water tower. So water towers are one of our favorite structures to put antennas on like this. We also like to put antennas on rooftops. Uh, these are a little bit less noticeable. Uh, on the left is uh, one at a Papa John's where we have this non-penetrating mount and this little mast and an antenna on top and we can deliver gigabit speeds over that, uh, that antenna. Uh, the one in the middle is on 32 North Main in Belmont. We're providing downtown Wi-Fi. Uh, and we're providing regular service with the other antenna. On the right are some antennas on top of the Packard Place building in downtown Charlotte, or uptown Charlotte. And that's looking out over Romare Bearden Park, if you've been down to the park. So we have free, free public Wi-Fi in the park. We launched uh, free public Wi-Fi in downtown Belmont, which is something that I'd like to replicate here in Mount Holly. If you walk up and down North Main Street in Belmont and you go into Stowe Park, you are on one contiguous Wi-Fi zone. And by contiguous, that means you're not having to log on at one store, walk down the street, log on to somebody else's. You're just on it the entire way. You go into the park, you're still on the Wi-Fi. And it's all free to the user. One of our specialties is we customize and manage Wi-Fi zones for different places. I put a bunch of them here on the, on the slide just to give you a feel for how many we've done. It's not just Belmont but, and, and Mount Olive that I mentioned, but the town of Anger, North Carolina, we did the entire downtown and two of the parks. Uh, TechWorks Innovation Center, we did all their Wi-Fi. There's a co-working space in, called Tabris in Charlotte that we just did. Granville County, they have an expo center, we just put in their Wi-Fi. And I won't rattle all these off, but you can see we've done quite a few. Uh, the next one that's high on our list is the uh, last bullet, and that's the downtown Sanford. We're putting a pretty extensive uh, downtown Wi-Fi zone for them. One of the interesting things about having a downtown Wi-Fi zone is it enables you to do cool new applications. So here's a couple uh, that I wanted to mention. In Anger, they hooked up a weather cam. So WRAL now has live weather cam reports from downtown Anger. And they were able to do that because they were able to connect their weather cam camera back to our internet over the Wi-Fi. And on the right is a digital kiosk. Uh, they started putting these in in downtown Belmont. There's a speed test that might be a little hard for you to see, but we're actually getting 200 megabit speed to the kiosk on the street in downtown Belmont. So as visitors are going in the area and they want to look up information, they can go right up to the kiosk. It is digitally connected. So here's our proposal for uh, Mount Holly. 
we started with the main walking areas of downtown. The intent of a, a downtown Wi-Fi zone is to be where the people are. You want to be where the festivals are taking place, where people might be working at a community garden, which is up by the uh, Methodist Church, and where people are walking between the stores. So if you just kind of follow the red lines, you'll see kind of where we had anticipated uh, having the free Wi-Fi. Again, this is a contiguous zone, so you don't have to log on and log off at different places. Uh, this is also something that would belong to the town. You do not have to be an open broadband customer to use this. You don't have to put in any open broadband credentials. If you are a visitor, you are a resident, you can just get right on to the Wi-Fi zone. It is outdoor use only. So this is not subsidizing the businesses downtown to get free internet. So this works out on the sidewalks and out where the festivals are. So it's for the community. It's free to the public. You can think of it as an amenity for both residents and visitors, help attract more people to come downtown. It demonstrates that the city is forward thinking and that you can have an infrastructure that can support all kinds of new applications. I mentioned the weather cam and the digital kiosk earlier, but they could be digitally equipped parking meters or uh, you can put in your own digital kiosk. You can put in cameras. Whatever you want to connect to the internet, the infrastructure would be there to do it. And it would belong to you. This isn't something that belongs to open broadband. As part of the downtown Wi-Fi, we would put in a splash page. Splash page is that first page you see when you join the internet, like if you're at a hotel and it asks you to sign in and agree to terms and conditions. On that splash page, we can advertise whatever the city would like. It can be upcoming events. You could sell advertisements to the local merchants. Maybe they want to help fund this project by sponsoring ads. You can use that splash page for whatever you like, but it doesn't go to open broadband. It goes to whatever the town of Mount Holly wants to have on that splash page. Will it also measure usage? So you can see how many people are actually using this. If you're going to make the investment in it, how often is it being used? And lastly, when we install these, we don't just put in the equipment and then turn around and walk away and say, good luck. No, we actively manage it. We maintain it. If something goes wrong, we're going to fix it. We are local. So you give us a call. Half the time, we're probably going to be at TechWorks. Uh, so right down in Belmont, we'll come up here and fix it. Uh, but we don't just leave you on your own. We're here to make sure it's a good experience for everyone. What we would like to have access to are the light poles in downtown. They have electrical outlets near the top, and they're ideally situated in the entire area that I drew on the map earlier. And this is a bit of show and tell. Be okay if I pass this around? So this is one of the antennas that would provide the Wi-Fi service. It's uh, made by Ubiquity. Uh, it's called Unify. It weighs less than six ounces. As you can see, it's pretty small. With the uh, little antennas, it's about 13 inches long. We would mount this on the pole and then plug it into one of the outlets that already exist. It consumes about eight watts of power. So think of it like a really small light, <laughs> a little bit more than a night light but not much, but that's all the power that it would consume. And these are meshing devices, and what meshing devices mean is it lets you roam from pole to pole to pole, and that service coverage extends the entire way. So by mounting these on the top of the light poles, you could basically extend the free Wi-Fi zone you know, throughout downtown and keep it high enough where it's out of people's reach. Downtown Wi-Fi was what I came here to, to talk to you about, but if you think about what's possible with the type of technology that's out there, you could roll this out in parks. You could put it in the Greenway. You could put Wi-Fi wherever you think that internet access would be nice to have. Mount Holly could become a gigabit city. There's no reason why we couldn't provide gigabit service to the businesses downtown. I realize that's not a city purchase, but that would just be something that would be an amenity of uh, Mount Holly and put you on the map. 
Uh, you could get your own kiosks, digital parking meters. Uh, we could also potentially reach some of your hard to reach locations. So if you have a wastewater plant or water treatment plant that doesn't have good access to internet and is kind of remote from uh, the main campuses here, if we had the ability in the future to get on your water towers, we could potentially extend, extend the signal out there as well. Um, this was just a little mock-up drawing that I had at one uh, point <coughs> about the park and providing free public Wi-Fi there. That wasn't what I came to talk to you about today, but this is all possible. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. What would you like to know about downtown Wi-Fi? Council, I have any questions other than what does this cost? <laughs> what does this cost? <laughs> so we had a proposal a while back that we wanted to make sure we trued up and covered the areas that you wanted us to cover. It was $500 a month for the service, uh, unlimited usage. And uh, there was an upfront cost for the equipment itself. Uh, it depends a little bit of exactly where uh, you want all of it covered, but we're looking at less than $2,000 upfront. So, um, any questions before I ask my questions? So, if you wanted to be a gigabyte city, what does that look like? So, we would bring uh, fiber into downtown Mount Holly. We would offer all the businesses within reach, probably within about a half mile of downtown, the ability to buy on their own uh, gigabit internet. We would put up antennas on the rooftop, similar to similar to uh, one of these on the left. And it would just be something that if the town could help support us with the Wi-Fi zone that would allow us uh, sort of the uh, spark to kind of get us started in the city. And then we could offer this up to businesses at their own expense. Would it be available, uh, would, I guess your internet services be available to residents? It would, right. What would a typical resident pay for internet access. So our low cost resident plan starts at thirty nine ninety nine a month for unlimited usage. For a gigabyte? Not for a gigabyte though. Oh. That's for our lower speed, right? What is your lower speed? Uh, twenty five megabit speed, twenty five by three, okay. which is the FCC definition of broadband. So if someone is using like AT and T DSL service and getting two or three megabit, they're paying more than forty dollars for it. So for basically the same price or a little bit less, you're getting 10 to 20 times faster speed. Okay. Ms. Schumacher? Is there like a, what would be like a higher tier on that? Like, so do we you only have the low, like? No, we offer 50 megabit service, 100 megabit service, 200 megabit service, and then the gigabit. Uh, Hannon Orthodontics is one of our gigabit customers uh, at their Belmont location. It's you know, a little over $300 a month for the gigabit. So it's, it's something that's probably a little pricey for your average resident, but for a business, that's not much at all for what you can do with it. Okay. Yes, sir. So you described being able to set up cameras. So can we have more than one or is it only support one? How does that work? Now you can have multiple cameras on it. Uh, what would happen is the more cameras you have going simultaneously, the more bandwidth it's going to take. We might have to increase the capacity, which would increase the price a little bit, but not horrible. Yes, sir. And my second question, you mentioned the kind of landing page whenever you first come in, and one of the concepts that I've floated several times is could you have a parking map or a link to a, a parking kind of directional guide of some sort that, that we could have? I mean, because my, my vision for this one when I raised it is you come downtown, it pops up and says, hey, you know, I get free Wi-Fi. Um, and one of the biggest questions I hear from folks is, well, where do I park? There's no parking on the street. We have a lot of parking. You just have to know where it is and how to get there. So I'm hoping that this would provide us a platform to one service the, the Wi-Fi needs of the festivals and that, which I guess my question would be how many people could be on it before it crashes, but also to be able to use it in lower use times to find where to park. Sure. So uh, one way you could show the parking is to have it on the splash page itself. So when somebody logs on with their phone, they access the system, the, the information is right there. A second way would be have a link to it on a splash page. So maybe you have other information you want to convey, but then also have a parking link and they can click that and, and get the information. And then how many people does it support if we've got 3,000 people down on the 4th of July, is it actually going to function? 
Each of these uh, little antennas can hold about 250 customers. So if we end up putting 15 or 20 of these spread out around downtown, it would depend on how concentrated it is around a particular pole. But you're looking at overall system being several thousand people at a time. So the answer is it could. If you, like we, just so you know, I mean, there's a band down there and most of the people in around that area, I don't know how many, I'm not good at guessing, but um, you know, just, we may have peaks and flows, but that could happen, okay. Has anybody been to the Taylorsville Apple Festival, any chance? I missed it this year. Did y'all go? I missed it uh, too. I, I, we didn't go. Mr. Moore. Okay, you said you were going to attach these to the light poles. So what if you don't have a light pole in the area? Like, for instance, the, uh, the, the garden, the uh, community garden, or I saw on the map there was a place that went kind of behind, uh, beside the southern south main kitchen around BB&T, a little square there that was... Kind of Correct. So uh, our approach at the community garden is we'd like to have a building location there, whether it's on the church itself or one of the other structures. We have to get their permission to do it, but it can go elsewhere besides the pole. If we wanted to hit some of the parking lots, um, I believe you have some events behind the Catawba Coffee area, kind of on the left, upper left on the map. Are there events in the back parking lot there? Not, no. not yet. Okay, it's possible though. It's but if, if you wanted to, yeah, if you wanted to cover some of those areas, we have to put up additional antennas. I think um, okay. So I hear interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, why don't we look at a formal proposal with different options, so that we can consider those options, in, inclusive of some of the comments here, but also our parks. So Tuck Park, River Street Park, you know, specifically those are our biggest parks. Um, and what that would look like and the cameras, you know, what is it per camera? What is that, how does that look? You know, that type of thing. And I'm just trying to incorporate the, what I've heard here. And, and when you talked about $500 a month, is that, you know, I mean, would that be a, a contract that we would have? Would that increase after two years? We need to know all this stuff. It would be a fixed price contract. So like when we did the uh, city of Belmont, it was a five year uh, fixed price for them. Unlimited usage for the downtown. Now the 500 was just for downtown. If we start to add all these other things that we're sure. gonna have to look at that. Yeah. Well, we just want to see what that looks like. Sure. And then we, we may add it later, we, we don't know. Yeah. So that'll be good. Other, other questions, Ms. Mr. McCorkle. I think it's all the maintenance, you guys will handle that. That's right. Anything goes wrong, we're a phone call away. We live within, you know, 30 minute drive. We can be here. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Next item is Autumn Woods traffic plan. Mr. Braswell. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, uh, during the January 13th Council meeting, uh, staff presented the traffic study and recommendations for Autumn Woods subdivision. This was in response to the HOA president coming talking about uh, the perception of speeding in the neighborhood. And staff took Council's suggestion to look into uh, striping defined lanes of travel along Autumn Woods Boulevard. Um, the estimate to stripe Autumn Woods Boulevard, Boulevard uh, is approximately seven thousand dollars that's for a double yellow center line uh, two solid white lines going in either direction then bike lane markings throughout the neighborhood and then uh, signage and so staff recommends moving forward with the striping plan of course this is an estimate only we'd have to get uh, bids on it but uh, the estimate is seven thousand dollars at this time council um, have any questions for mr. Praswell Council, which take any action? Mr. Meadows? I'd like to move that we move forward with the proposal. Second by Ms. Shoemaker. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes. That felt good. <laughs> it was really quick. <laughs> that felt good. All right, move along. This one Can, may take a little bit more time, but not too uh, much. Uh, you've done a tremendous job on ADA. We agree, and we think it's a fantastic all plan. All right. Great. 
right. Consideration approval. <laughs> what are we going to say? <laughs> All, right. All right. Move approval. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, good I mean, with that, I mean, we, we, we You've done the, a tremendous amount of work. You've communicated you. for two years, you know. But Presented please continue. I appreciate that, but I'm only the representation of the ADA committee given that you, you saw the list of people that were involved, so I just can't take all the credit. It's staff. They, they did all the work, so I'm just up here as the, the pre presenter, and so just going through the process, uh, they did a great job. Um, and so we are asking that council consider this plan for adoption this time. There's a motion on the floor. Uh, I know, but I wanted to let him finish and not interrupt him. <laughs> who, who had the motion? Mr. Meadows, second by Ms. Shoemaker. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes. See, that's what good work will do when all those other people just to use you to talk. I think it's great. So it's all that leg work. <laughs> that's right. No, it is. It's, it's, thank you. I appreciate it's it. a culmination of a lot of hard work. Thank you. Uh, next, consideration of approval agreement with City of Belmont regarding a proposed water connection South Gateway area. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council. I, d I did have an hour and a half presentation, but I will, <laughs> I will boil it down to something very quick. Move the table. Belmont has one water line coming across 85. They're going to build a hospital which needs secured water source. They've asked to actually interconnect with our water system for emergency purposes only. They pay for everything. We review the plans. And if we have an emergency on our side, we can also then open up the valves. So uh, our... Uh, no, let Just one more second. I just have a question. Our, okay, our, yes, stop now. Question. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, where is the, the hospital and the potential connection? Like where, like along the line, where are we looking at that? Okay, so the, the line will actually uh, parallel I-85 down and come across the Abbey property all the way up to where the uh, hospital will be. Okay. Second question, is there any actual downside to this? I can't, I can't see one. I, uh, me either. I there, agree with you. There, okay, pull it down. There's no downside. It gives you both redundancy. Yeah. There's some things that Kemp has worked with David on in the city of Belmont. Well, really, the response to them in their proposal for an agreement. Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend approval pending uh, contractual agreement between the city of Mount Holly and Belmont. That would be, Kemp, is that okay? Yes. I mean, that would be what I would do. There's no downside to this. We should have done it. We tried to do it years ago, but the Abbey wouldn't let us go across their property. Now they have. Well, they now it's their mad. property, they and they're mad. selling a hospital, so they have to. Yeah. Okay. Basically, it. So anybody want to make a motion? Motion by Ms. Shoemaker, second by Mr. McCorkle. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes. I'll consider one more motion. Mr. Moore, motion to adjourn. <laughs> second. Hold on. Yeah. I miss Polish. All those in favor, <laughs> please raise your right hand. Motion passes. <laughs> Phyllis really did beat you by a split second, but I wanted you—I hey, wanted her to do it. I wanted her to do it too. That's right. Thank everybody for.